SEOs have ruined the internet. Like that's <laughs> mainstream news now, day in and day out, 24 seven <laughs> looking for examples and haven't found any. And, and everyone's always like, oh, it's because you're only looking at your own sites. I'm like, honestly, like I saw a lot of the patterns really quickly. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is a lot of sites. There's a lot of sites that are doing the same kind of thing SEO wise. And I tend to tell people that the, the way they solve the SEO problem is to stop thinking about SEO a little bit uh, <laughs> and, and do something else. Stop getting your marketing advice from the exact same place and doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. As we're coming to the tail end of the March 2024 core update, many things have changed in Google's landscape in the past months. The update is still rolling out at the time at which I'm recording, but it's probably just a matter of days until it's done. So now I think is a good start to look at where we landed. And to help navigate these changes, I wanted to bring a guest that is in the trenches every day, and I couldn't think of anyone better than Lily Ray. She's a very opinionated character in the industry, and personally, I love that. But most importantly, she works at a large SEO agency in New York, and when she doesn't work, she still shares a ton of interesting insights about SEO on social media, including a lot of original research. In this episode, Lily and I don't beat around the bush and we cover some of the hottest topics in search right now. We talk about the visibility changes for pure content sites and how your business model may affect your visibility. We also talk about Reddit and Quora monopolizing search results and how long it may last. We talk about HCU and the divergence between Google's guidelines and what we actually observe on the field. We talk about EEAT and whether it's even a thing anymore or it's mostly tied to your domain's authority. We also talk about the kind of signals outside of traditional SEO that Google is probably giving a lot of importance to these days. And there's a lot more little nuggets and nuance in our discussion as we talk about specific examples that often break the rules. If you don't have time to watch the whole thing, no problem. I've recorded a too long didn't watch section that you can find on the last chapter of the video or at the end of the podcast if you're listening to audio with my main takeaways from the discussion. But before we get started, first, let me thank today's episode sponsor, Ahrefs, your Swiss Army Knife SEO tool. I'll tell you more about them a bit later, but for now, let's jump into the interview. All right, in today's episode, I have Lily Ray. I'm really happy to have you, Lily. I know you're like a very opinionated person in this industry, and I like people with strong opinions because I like debating about stuff. So thanks for joining. And uh, Let's get started. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. No worries. So today we're going to talk obviously about everything that's happening with Google right now. Uh, recent update, but I kind of want to reverse back to the last HCU that came out as well, like you know, in uh, September last year, because I think a lot of things are connected and uh, and started happening around there, around with the three other core updates. Um, but I want to talk to you as a user of Google to start with, because I think you know when Google released this update, they basically promised. 40% less unhelpful content. Uh, and we're almost done with the rollout at this point. You know, they said around a month, uh, a month is in two days at this point. So unless something incredible happens, I think what we're seeing here is mostly what we're going to get. As a user, how do you feel like there's 40% less unhelpful content in Google right now? <laughs> I personally find it, like generally speaking, I find it harder to find what I'm looking for on Google lately. I'll just say that mm -hmm. much. Um, I think. A lot of the times it feels like the results are blown out with certain sites. I think we'll talk a lot about like Reddit and Quora and stuff like this. And that's especially now given that like, I mean, it's always weird searching for things being a professional SEO, but like knowing that things like Reddit, Reddit and Quora are spammed so easily, I just don't click on them as much. So yeah. when they're when they're so prolific in the search results, it makes it harder to actually find what I'm looking for. I, I personally find that it's kind of like more generic pages that tend to rank. So Google tends to assign more keywords to a given page. They rank for more keywords and more long tail, you know, more, more long tail content that, you know, sometimes sometimes was created to game Google tends to be less present now. But now you, you just tend to have a big site with a generic generic page and your answer may be in the middle of it. It's a yeah. bit tedious to find the answer personally. How about the update in general? Like what, what did you like if you had to like do three main takeaways from what you've seen so far in a current rollout. Like, what would you tell people? What, what have you seen? One thing that's important to talk about that I don't even talk about that much when I post, because generally when I'm sharing visibility, I'm us usually getting it from Systrix. I also use Ahrefs and SEMrush, but I most of the time when I'm looking at website visibility, I'm using Systrix. What Systrix is not showing, and this is by design, and what a lot of these tools are not necessarily showing is how different the search results are in general. Like we're just like mm. counting visibility of organic results, but what we're not looking at is necessarily SGE. We're not looking at how ads are different, not looking at product cards, like all these different things are, everything's changing in the search results. So like 
in order to find an organic result, you have to dig at this point. You have to like kind of like scroll down and go over SGE and go over ads and stuff like that. So that's also an important aspect of something to consider with this update. But as far as uh, what's changing, I I guess I'm <laughs> maybe I sound naive. I'm sure a lot of people think I'm naive, but I, I wasn't expecting Reddit and Quora to continue to grow <laughs> at the same rate that they were. Yeah. Fair enough. Wasn't. Yeah, it's, it's and they dipped a, do, a bit a bit at the beginning, and then they kind of came back up. So it's like you were like, oh, yeah. finally, finally, it's coming down a bit, and it's like, well, actually, no. Yeah. Uh, I'm especially surprised for Quora. Like, there's literally hate videos on TikTok of people saying how much they hate the UX of Quora, right? And and how yeah. much they feed you more questions than give you the answer. So, uh, Reddit, you know, the original Reddit without the, the all the gaming that's going on with SEO right now. Fair enough. It's kind of a cool forum, you know. Yeah, I loved. I used to love Reddit back in the day. Not so much anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah, fair, because because it's being being given visibility, right? I will talk a little bit about that later. But uh, I I feel Google is just offloading spam fighting to Reddit, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like I agree. It's one thing that you've mentioned that's quite interesting is the sub features. We we rank for a lot of like you know these queries, for example. And I know a lot of travel bloggers have suffered from that as well, where Google literally takes all your list items and shows them with drop downs on top of yeah. the SERPs and like pushes your organic results massively. So I open GSC, and it's like my, you know, my impressions are the same, my ranking's not down, et cetera. Yet these pages may drop like 20, 30% traffic on some queries following both HU last year and this update. Uh, and I feel like they're pushing a lot of, like, I feel like SG is taking different forms. It's not just a, a chat, basically. It's just like yeah. uh, when they demonstrated their, uh, their new AI models, they were showing that it builds UX as well. And it takes information and does that. I was like, oh, this is for search, you know, like they're actually making this so that search becomes kind of like a ever morphing uh, yeah. thing. And I agree. I think that's, uh, that's something that you may not see in rank trackers or in visibility tools, but actually sites do lose visibility from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to share a little story of a site owner that actually is winning from this update that I've talked to. I can't reveal his site. He asked me not to. And basically, he is in one vertical that where he has one of his sites, two of his sites, actually, that really jumped up in the current update. But he has many other sites in the same niche, right? And it's the same content pipeline. It's the same writers. It's the same EEAT. It's the same content production, the same production house. Yet, some sites are diving with these updates while others are going up massively. So this site is essentially producing the same content and having completely different results. Essentially the definition of insanity by Einstein, you know? <laughs> uh, so how would you how would you explain that right now? Well, impossible to give a good answer without really digging into the data, but I don't I don't know that I necessarily agree that there's ever a such thing as two sites that have the same EEAT, two sites that are doing the exact same content. Like de by definition, every page is different. The link profile is probably slightly different. The link profile is different, yeah. You know, like there's all these elements that could be different. Maybe the category that one's publishing it is slightly different than the other one. Maybe there's a big player. Like it's never truly apples to apples. So that's one thing. But yeah, I think uh, there's there's proving to be a lot of categories that are like extremely volatile right now. I think that, you know, going back to like the HCU conversation, it feels like, um, I don't know, I keep seeing patterns of certain categories of keywords or classes of keywords that seem to be hit harder than others. So maybe one of them mm. is more in that like area where there's a lot more volatility than the other. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, yeah, on this case, I mean, I've actually observed these domains and I've seen him start moving the content from the sites that got essentially killed by HCU to the sites that are now winning and the content wow. is ranking just fine, basically. Uh, yeah. So so it's like, I feel like a lot of this is, is not just the helpfulness of the content, but rather the domain is posted on at this point. Like, I mean, HCU originally was a site-wide classifier, so kind of makes sense. However, in the recent core update, they've updated the documentation and they, like, as they integrate it in the core algorithm, they say it's mostly a page level thing, but if you have a lot of unhelpful content, your domain may be affected. Yeah. Yeah. They <laughs> How changed, do you feel about that? <laughs> they changed the wording. I think it's interesting. They say like we mostly evaluate it on the page level, but we still have some site-wide signals that we look at. So it's like they're saying both things are true. I don't really know what's going on, but I feel like, yeah, the, the site-wide classifier, that's language that they're not really using anymore. 
Um, they did change the whole definition of how they analyze and identify unhelpful content. And it's like much, much more vague now. It sounds like they're baking it into the core algorithm. They use a variety of signals to assess helpfulness. So like it used to be more easy to explain how the helpful content system worked, but they actually mm -hmm. kind of dismantled that with this update. So I wonder to your point, like, I wonder if this whole notion of like a domain classifier was a thing that just existed temporarily and now we're having like Google analyze things in different ways. I don't exactly know, but it does, it does feel, I mean, the last six months have been a really interesting moment because I'm seeing more and more, <laughs> and I'm sure you're seeing this too, where it's like very much a binary thing. People, people that were affected by the helpful content update are playing by, I don't even want to say it, their own set of rules because that's not how Google describes it, but like there's a certain situation happening with those sites that's not happening with sites that weren't hit. So now whenever I share anything, I'm, I always have to be very specific. Right now I'm speaking to the HCU people. Right now I'm not speaking to the HCU people because truly they're in very different situations. Yeah, I get I get Penguin vibes. You know, when Penguin came out, like there was no disavow tool. It was yeah. all about links. Like, And very often if you had bad links pointing to your site, it was very hard to remove them because these sites were unmonitored basically. And for a year, it was technically impossible to recover for Penguin, basically. Like, nobody yeah. recovered. And, uh, and I, get, I get a very f similar vibe. Like, it's not the same thing. It feels more like a, it feels more similar to Panda, the way it actually works. But if the vibe of the industry feels very much like how Penguin works, where there was no way for people to escape once they got caught. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's like, do you think we'll see any kind of proper recovery this year? Because I don't think we have any real good one documented at this point. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty commonly understood now. Those of us who spend day in and day out 24 seven <laughs> looking for examples and haven't found any yet. Find and everyone's <laughs> always like, oh, it's because you're only looking at your own sites. I'm like, that's not how I work. I'm looking at a lot of sites, not necessarily only just the sites that I'm working on. It's funny you bring up Penguin because I've mentioned this before on other podcasts and things, but that's that was how I kind of got started in the SEO industry. I, I you know a couple of years before that, but like I really started ramping up my SEO skills and success and, and case studies and everything with buying links. And it was working really, really, really well mm -hmm. until it didn't. And that day was like the most, to this day, the most traumatizing day of my whole career. It was <laughs> awful. It was completely awful. And every, like, I, I felt like everybody was that was trusting me and I was doing such a good job suddenly lost faith in what I was doing for good reason. And that's why I am the way that I am today. And that's not the only uh, update where that's happened. It's like, I don't want to do that ever again, you know? I get it. I mean, it's like we had an agency at the time. I think 40% of our clients got affected. But it's like back in the day, like it was so easy to game Google with paid links. It was almost yeah. impossible to rank White Hat, right? It's like literally it didn't make financial sense and it, it, it wasn't even working very well to do yeah. the right thing. Like I remember Distilled was trying very hard doing some digital PR, et cetera, but it was massively overpriced for the results they were getting compared to other agencies, let's be honest. Yeah, I didn't even uh, think I was breaking the rules. I was so new at SEO. I was like, I thought this is just what you do because it works. <laughs> it's like, I didn't yeah, even know. Yeah. I, we did the same and that's when we switched as well. We kind of had PTSD from that time a yeah. little bit. And uh, so, yeah, but I get it. Uh, especially when you like, like do see something for like other people's businesses, like it's, it's, heartbreaking to see them walk on it, not realize what has been done and lose income they relied on to pay salaries to, to do all of that, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and that's very much the vibe that's happening to some publishers right now with HCU as well, a little bit, except they're not even sure they did anything wrong. Uh, <laughs> that's what's tricky. And that's, I mean, that's to be, if I had done more research when I was a young new SEO and I knew that this was against Google's guidelines and I had the prior experience to know what happened with like the Florida update and the Panda update and things like this, I, I probably would have played my cards differently, but I didn't. And I had to learn the hard way and I moved into the mm. agency world and I swore to never do that again. And that's why I've been so risk averse for so many years, because there have been other examples where whether it's people on my team or whether it's like the client or someone's kind of like pushing things a little bit too far. And it's not exactly something that goes against Google guidelines, but it's something where it's like, I think that this might get us in trouble. It always gets you in trouble. It always fails eventually. I so it's I mean, like, I have an employee that did that AI site scaled to a million visits per month. And I was like, I don't know if it's going to last, man. It's like, probably you shouldn't quit your job right now. And yeah. uh, well, he, it's good he didn't because uh, it didn't go as well during this update. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I saw on Twitter that you said that your team reviewed a bunch of examples of sites that, you know, people said they were unfairly hit by HCU, right? And yeah. uh, I wanted to ask, like, what you learned during the exercise. Like, what did you take away from that? 
Yeah, and first of all, you know, we've been looking at this and I've been looking at this for, for months. I mean, uh, when the HCU in September hit, I was actually in Prague and I was planning to take two days off mm-hmm. and I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I ended up working pretty much both those two days to like try to figure out what was going on because I was so interested. And I looked at dozens and dozens of sites and I just I honestly like I saw a lot of the patterns really quickly and I was like, oh, wow, this is this is a lot of sites. There's a lot of sites that are doing the same kind of thing SEO wise. And this is why it's turned out to be such a big update because it's true. There were like thousands of affected sites by this. Um, But what's tricky right now, and I always want to be really sensitive to like, I know that you you said it before, a lot of people had no idea that what they were doing was like in the gray area of Google's guidelines or it's something that could eventually work against their sites. I think most people were probably in that situation. Um, But I also think right now, and I don't mean to be mean to anybody or insensitive, but it's very easy to say, yeah, Google sucks and they're unfair and my site's awesome and like, how dare they? (laughs) There are some sites who should feel that way. That's fine. But mostly mostly there's, this is what happens in SEO. You have to adapt. You know, sometimes we are like, we have to learn the hard way that, oh, geez, that doesn't work anymore or Google's on to us, or Google changed directions, Google pivoted, Google got too much feedback from its users that doesn't like this type of thing. So this is what SEO is, it's dynamic, like you know, it's never the same thing. Every year is completely different. What worked last year doesn't work this year. Like, So this is just a really excruciating moment where a lot of the things that worked last year don't work this year anymore. Yeah, uh, in terms of the sites you looked at, like what were like the five main things that people would uh, not necessarily doing right, basically? Well, most of these sites, um, first of all, they, they follow these like SEO driven exploits or like opportunities very closely. Mm-hmm. Like they find something that works and then they multiply it a thousand times, right? You know, when is the release date of XYZ show? Okay. That worked once, got you a lot of traffic, got you a lot of yeah, discover show, traffic. Yeah. And then let's do one per week for every single possible show. And then maybe you don't exactly say when the release date is. That's a really extreme example, but like... What's on Netflix next week? Um, you know, what are the top 10 places to go in New York City? What, like all these things, they're just pattern driven. And then they find a really like SEO optimized way to write the headline, SEO optimized way to structure the content. They have FAQs and all the things that Danny Sullivan mentioned in his tweet a couple of weeks ago. And like those things in and of themselves are not bad. A lot of times those are actually great for user experience. But when Google sees thousands of thousands of sites using the exact same pattern, using the exact same keyword research tools, and maybe Google's users, Google was able to identify because let's remember they have a million times more data than all of us. They were able to identify that maybe their users are like really sick of this type of experience on Google. And the news mm. is talking about SEOs have ruined the internet. Like that's mm. mainstream news now. Google is pivoting to protect the interests of its searchers. Now, do I think they're getting it right all the time? No, but it's clear. It's pretty clear what they're trying to do, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like they're punishing what was rewarded yesterday. And yep. that's kind of like what's helpful for a lot of people. It's like, the way to get visibility yesterday was to do that. And you could argue that making templates for content is also a way to essentially, you know, ensure of like standardization of quality as well in terms of like, you know, research processes. If you do it properly, right? I'm not talking yeah. about low quality sites, but like if you're like a travel blog, but you know, you have like a checklist of like what to check in every place to make sure you cover it properly, et cetera, then essentially your content is going to tend to look that way. And it's more of a way to improve the process than a way to try to exploit the user. Yeah. Um, and if these patterns are essentially punishing the, 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 the publishers in the end, you could argue that they're promoting essentially more chaotic content, uh, potentially because seeing the same thing bores the end user, even though it's better put together, I guess. Um, yeah. But it, it's... It's like, you know, it's like McDonald's became McDonald's because they do the burger the same way every time. It doesn't mean (laughs) that people got bored of it, you know? Yeah. But I think, I think like, you know, everyone loves to hate on Reddit and Quora. I I get it. Like I'm equally frustrated, especially by Quora in terms of like, as a user, it's quite (laughs) frustrating, but let's think about the fact, let's think about these two things happening at the same time. Number one, we have the HCU where to your point, a lot of travel bloggers, a lot of this type of thing, or they're losing visibility. On the other hand, we have Google exponentially increasing the visibility of Reddit and Quora and not just them. There's like a handful of user generated sites. So user generated content. So if you think about those two things together, Google is elevating the most authentic 
like human experience, real experience oriented content. And yeah, it's not a great user experience. And of course it's contaminated by spammers at this point, but like that's ultimately what those sites are for. Those sites are for, to your point, like let's offload it to Reddit and Quora to have real human beings talking about their experience traveling to Nigeria or whatever. But when you have a thousand travel bloggers who are essentially writing the exact same cookie cutter, like things to know, things to bring, these are the five affiliate links to click on this and this, and it's all kind of the exact same. It seems like Google's moving away from that. And yeah, of course, we have to think about the fact that SGE is coming, which essentially does exactly what <laughs> just like summarizes right. what everybody said about the place. But I'm seeing now examples of travel bloggers, and I'm not just using travel as an example. This is true for right. a variety of different niches, where the people who are writing the content are have been doing it for a long time. And when you read it, it's overflowing with firsthand experience. Like, especially with travel, I was just reading one. This is a woman travel blogger. Her site wasn't hit by these updates. It's like, she's only writing about the places that she's truly been and spent a lot of time and has a lot to say about them. And the entire blog is firsthand experience. It says the word I mm -hmm. thousands of times. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we recommend people to do that actually in uh, in our guidelines. So it's like just, yeah. yeah. But but the thing is like, th there are also people who share first-hand experience who just got slammed by the updates. So it's like, yeah. uh, it's, 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 it just feels like inconsistent. It, it, the way you express this, like I was thinking, like are they punishing more category than like a single site? Uh, you know what I mean? I think certain categories, I think there's certain categories that are flagged more because they're so accessible. Like, believe me, I travel all the time. I literally had the thought, I was like, maybe I'll start a travel blog, you know? Cause it's like, it's not hard to do, especially with this no, like new digital nomad, you know, people can work remotely. Like it's relatively low barrier to entry to say, I want to start a travel blog and monetize and make money off travel. Like that's one, I would say gaming is one. I would say VPNs and tech product reviews is one. There's certain ones Ooh, where yeah. you can just be at home and you can review products to start a blog. So it's like, those are easier to enter into, I would say, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, so there's probably more well, people VPN, that got uh, affected. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, you know what I mean? Like there's some that yeah, are just yeah. like, I'm going to start a blog and this is what I'm going to write about. And it's like, okay, anybody can kind of write about that stuff. Um, but I think, yes, to your point, there are especially like small travel bloggers who maybe their sites are like 400 pages and they got hit because their sites look a lot like the big, bigger travel sites that got hit and this is machine learning and Google got a lot of things wrong. It's correlation yeah. basically, right? It's like, yeah. if, it's, that's why I was asking like a couple of weeks ago, I was like, um, is tech stack potentially bad for websites? So it's like, you know, you go to the spam communities, they all recommend the same theme, they all recommend the same hosting, they all like, how hard would it be for Google to just pick up on that stuff and be like, you know what, like, you know, it doesn't mean your site's gonna like, penalize if you're using one of these things, but you're much more likely to be hit um, for, for sharing the same tech stack. And, and, and is it a good idea to differentiate your tech stack at this point? Well, it's, it's, it's again, <laughs> Google would say it's not for Google, right? So it's like the, the tech stack and the things that they're using are not inherently bad. Like whatever WordPress I template agree. you chose, yeah. whatever ad network you chose. But you correlate. It's correlation, yes. So I think the, the bigger problem there is stop getting your marketing advice from the exact same place and doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. That's agree, probably yeah. the better advice. I don't think you should go in there and like try to trick Google with a new tech stack. Like, but maybe think about like, what are the, what's the best tech stack for my users? You know? I, I, I agree. It's just like, um, it's like if you find a good site that's been unfairly hit, like the idea of like moving away from a common tech stack from low quality sites, I don't think it's a horrible idea if you've tried everything else, basically. Yeah. It's like, it's not the first thing I would recommend, if, but if I don't find anything like inherently flawed with the website, it's probably something I would tell people, you know what, let's gamble on that, you know, let's see what happens when we change the theme, we move to a, a more premium hosting that is used by larger companies and things mm. like that, like let's move it to AWS and so on. Yeah. Uh, whatever, like just de-associate yourself with all of that. Um, one thing that makes it quite complicated for me to trust Google's world is Danny Sullivan saying that you can recover from HEU in just a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. he, and like, and it's been reported by multiple people, like several people backtracked, et cetera. But in the end, it's like, if you, if it, it's like, it didn't say two weeks, but it said a couple of weeks. Like, um, what do you think is going wrong here? Like on one side, I mean, I don't, I think Danny is a good guy, but it, it makes it complicated to, to say, you know, like listen to this guy if you want to actually do better because it doesn't reflect the reality of what we see in the field basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really 
tricky. Um, it, it's a really tricky time in SEO because like, like to your point and to everybody's point right now, it's very hard for us to believe anything they're saying if we don't have examples of it working the way that they say it's going to work. So one thing I think that's important to remember that nobody wants to talk about is that maybe, just maybe, not a single one of the affected sites has changed enough, has fixed itself enough to have the classifier removed or to be in a point where Google says this is a helpful website. I'm sorry, I'm just explaining if what Google's saying is true, and yeah, maybe they're lying to us and gaslighting us, all these things everyone's saying, but if what they're saying is true, maybe, just maybe, the sites are not better, as, as good as they need to be. And yes, you can point to all kinds of different examples of websites that weren't yeah, hit, yeah. but these websites were hit, and this is an unprecedented moment. Like you said, with Panda, with Penguin, it takes a really long time to build trust after that. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm saying in the history of SEO, we've had this happen before. And I've said it in numerous talks that I've given over the years. This stuff takes such a really long time. For whatever reason, the industry decided that six months is like Google's cutoff for the HCU. Oh, we all no, just like unanimously decided that that's when it's Danny called. said a couple of weeks though. Like he did say that. <laughs> but then again, right. maybe, I mean, we do have, there was someone that was responding to me yesterday. He's like, oh, I moved all my content to a new domain and it's working fine. I'm like, <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Maybe there's, months, yeah. yeah. Maybe there's loopholes or whatever, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, it's just like, I feel like he has a tough job right now. Like it's the yeah. law of defiance towards Google. It's like, I, I, I like the guy, but like, I'm not always a fan of the communication of Google uh, personally at this point. It's not an easy job. I, I agree. And now a quick word from the sponsor of today's episode. Imagine you just woke up, you're on your laptop, sipping your morning coffee and casually open your rank tracking tool. You hit the refresh button and take a bite into a fresh, juicy apple. And then it hits you. A sea of red arrows pointing down, your website traffic is down 30%. You open Twitter and people are running around like headless chickens trying to understand what happened. Nobody seems to know, except the gurus trying to pimp out their courses or services to help you recover your rankings. But you don't need them, because Ahrefs got your back. A couple days after the update, you can use their new organic competitor report, set the dates to compare the traffic now and before the update, and pinpoint exactly who has been winning the update. Or oh, maybe you just lost traffic for one important keyword. Well, you can also do that on the keyword level inside the Keyword Explorer. Set the compare date to before the update and seamlessly see who went up and down. You now have a personalized blueprint on who to model after to regain your lost rankings thanks to Ahrefs. But you don't need to wait until your site goes down to an update to use these tools and gain traffic today by outsmarting your competition. So check out Ahrefs on ahrefs.com and you too can be an SEO genius. And now back to the interview. Do you think business model is a ranking factor at this point? Uh, you tweeted about the idea of potentially adding a shopping cart uh, to websites. Obviously, this should be a lot more fleshed out, and I'm sure there's a lot around that, etc. But like, do you feel like it it matters? Like, if you're like an agency, a SaaS versus a content site at this point? Uh, I don't know about ranking factor. I would say that I'm seeing, especially with this update, even just things that I was digging into this morning. Um, there seems to be a pattern emerging. Uh, mm. Pure content websites, small niche publishers, seem to be having a harder time maintaining visibility compared to sites that have some type of product plus a blog. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say stuff like this, I'm really not like when people respond by saying, Oh, I'm going to add an e-commerce, you know, section <laughs> to my website solution, yeah. <laughs> that then I'm going to recover from the HCU. It's like, that's why Google got frustrated when I posted this, because it's like, no, everyone needs to stop thinking about these things as a band aid. They need to think about why did the website that has the product and generally speaking, these are products that exist before the blog. The product is first, the blog is second. The blog is a way yep. to capture more visibility, more people searching, more upper funnel searches, that type of thing to drive people back to your product. So I think that the nature of a website that has some type of core offering, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's SaaS, whether it's an app, whether it's community, whatever, and then they do some type of SEO, you know, um, driving awareness, producing content on top of that as a layer on top of that, yes. I think those sites are holding up better now than sites that are just the informational component, for sure. Yeah, um, my, my feeling around that is it's kind of like the search behavior around the brand that changes when you sell something and people actually consider yep. buying it. 
Like, yep. you know, they search for reviews, they search for return policies, uh, they go check the name plus trust pilot or whatever. Yeah. They like it. And, then, and then I think that's probably what drives the visibility of the sites, which means that if you just put a bogus e-com on the site, but there's no demand for the product and no behavior from users that follows that, potentially yeah. that's not going to solve the problem, basically. Yeah, and it's it's more than just adding e-commerce. When I when I posted about this, and it, of course, got lost in translation like everything on Twitter, um, <laughs> Again, it's not a Band-Aid, but there are examples, and I have literally clients that come to mind of this. They're publisher websites. That's what they've always been. They make money from ads and affiliate links. That's what they've always been for years. However, people like the publisher so much, and you could think of this as like a recipe site as well. People like mm -hmm. the publisher site so much, or they like the brand or the person associated with that brand, or maybe a couple of the writers that work for that brand because they have a TikTok following, they have an Instagram following, they have people that really like their content. They now they've become a household name and they can sell merch or they can sell recipe books, cookbooks, right? These are all signals and it's not an SEO hack. This is a building a brand. This is building a product. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, the pioneer woman, she's like been on all the cooking shows. Like she's a brand, she's a household brand. I haven't checked that site, but I have a feeling they have e-commerce. So these are signals that show that you're more than just a content site. And yeah, last year you could just be a content site and make lots and lots of money just from that. Seems like the rules of the game have changed the way that they always do with SEO. So I'm not saying go add some stupid e-commerce section to your site, but if you're a brand to your point, um, there should be other signals that people like your brand and people search for your brand and maybe people wanna buy the mug with your brand name on it or whatever it is, you know? But also, like, um, I mean, the way I see it now is like, we don't just do SEO, we do, you know, ads, etc. And I see ads are pretty cheap and easy to make profitable on Facebook, for example, right now. For a lot of people, it's not very hard to launch a product and at least be break even running ads on Facebook, selling a decent product and generating real demand from real people who want to buy the product. Yeah. Uh, and that generates, like, the byproduct of that is that generates branded search traffic and people looking for the product, et cetera, because they get exposed to the ad, they, they, they had, they're buying, they're considering buying. And eventually that should generate signals that, you know, I'm not saying you're going to recover tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying either. Like yeah. I'm just saying you're going in the right direction in the eyes of Google. If you're, if you if you're doing that. Um, and, and I tend to tell people that the, the way they solve the SEO problem is to stop thinking about SEO a little bit, uh, <laughs> and, and do something else. Yeah. Um, because, uh, because, yeah, it's like you, you can't just, you can't get out of this with putting more keywords in your content, basically. That's, that's. Yeah. That's and I, I talk about this a lot too, because, um, I think a better way, and I, I, we, we work with our clients on these type of approaches, but a better way to think about it. And this is hard to do when you're a publisher website who needs to pay the bills and needs to pay your staff and you need to it's make a certain amount of that. revenue per month. But I think, and I've been saying this for a long time, a better way to think about SEO and producing content is to write about what you know and what you're excited about, and what you want to say. Uh, before you do any keyword research, before you do any editorial planning, it should be like, what is what are, what are the pain points that my customers have? What do I know about? What do I want to write about? Me, for example, I write a lot about SEO, as you can tell. Um, and I, I do it. It actually it frustrates my company because I'm so random. Like, I'm so like, I need to write about this thing because this thing happened last night and I have all these things to say about it. And I don't, that wasn't planned. That wasn't on the editorial calendar. That was because I have something to say because something happened. So, um, you know, if, if you can write from a place of like, I went to Greece and I had the best time and I can't wait to share the 10 things that I experienced when I was in Greece. It's not like, oh, we need to write 15 things about Greece this month. You know, you write yeah, about yeah. the thing that happened, the thing you know. It's just a different way of thinking about it. I mean, that's that's kind of how I planned this podcast. You know, I was like, you know what? Like, uh, <laughs> I planned this like literally two days ago, PDMing you because I thought it was the right time, basically. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, the thing is, like, for many companies, it's kind of hard to to work that way. Like, they need yeah. planning, they need all of that. I am sure you work with big clients, and I'm, I'm sure corporate clients are not really receptive to that idea. Uh, yeah, so. but you have to so. think about, like, so, like, let's say it's a lawyer, for example, um, and this is true. Like, when we work with personal injury attorneys or whatever type of lawyer it is, you might say, okay, yeah, of course, we have a certain editorial calendar. We have certain evergreen content that we want to be producing that we need to build on the blog, certain informational resources that make sense for this law firm to have on their blog. But... We also have this like incredible attorney that works there 
I'm just using a random example, by the way. But, yeah, yeah. you know, this this attorney, maybe something changed in the state of Georgia that the attorney wants to talk about. Or maybe yeah. they won a case yesterday that's really relevant for their audience to know about. That's when you take the excited content creator person and you get them on video, you get them on audio, you make it into a blog. You're like, you know, you get to Google Discover, you get into all these places that Google's seeing like, oh, they're actually like, they say something new, they say something original, they're breaking news, they have an opinion. Like, I think it's important to remember that it's not just about checking boxes and, and doing keyword research and making sure you're writing the same thing literally everybody else has written. That's how keyword research tools work. <laughs> it's about saying something new and original that people on your staff actually have opinions about. Yeah, uh, it's, it also means people need to be a bit more involved in the industry usually because quite often, you know, people who do that are managers. They don't really care about the topic, et cetera. It's, it's complicated to do that. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, EEAT. I mean, you'll be, you've been one of the first to really push that for a lot of people together with Mary Hines. Uh, and I'll be honest, I wasn't a big believer at the beginning. Uh, it's like I was like, and, and my, main, my main problem with it was like, how does Google actually measure that? Like, what is the practicality of measuring EEAT for a search engine that has to run on, you know, in a cost efficient way as well? Like, it can't just be uh, private investigating your life all around yeah. the internet, et cetera. Um, and, and, it, and it's funny because when EAT started becoming important, like people just started putting all these verified badges, et cetera, and all these, you know, editorial guidelines, all of that. And, and uh, you know, you see a plenty of sites that have been dunked by the updates that still have these things at this point. Uh, so it doesn't seem to have worked. But like, how do you explain that to someone, to a skeptic, that like, how does Google well, measure that EAT in practice. It's almost as if it's a constantly evolving uh, notion that spammers, like all things in SEO, are trying to trick Google into showing that they have it when they don't. So Google mm -hmm. has to continue to innovate on what that even means to have EEAT. And maybe now we're actually seeing the purest form of EEAT being manifested in the search results, which is, you know what? none of you guys get to compete because only the ones that have authority for decades are the ones that get to rank. Maybe that is EEAT. You know what I mean? How about, how about Reddit then? Like if you're an anonymous user. They have posting. EEAT. They have completely the, uh, EEAT. I mean, but yeah. But do the users that make their content have it? <laughs> this is a new challenge that is okay. Reddit's being, but if you ask, I mean, ask ChatGPT, ask, of course, ask anything that, ask Wikipedia. Reddit has been known for what, 20 years, like 15, uh -huh. 20 years yeah, yeah, yeah. as the place to go for real human interaction and the place that has rigorous moderation. I understand that might be falling apart lately, but like that's what it's known for. So in a sense, it is the authoritative place for user generated content. Uh, okay, but then that means it's really much more about the domain than it is about the content itself, right? Which means like- The domain, small... its reputation, the brand's reputation. So, uh, so how do you explain, express, for example, the explain, sorry, the Housefresh case, right? Housefresh is a pretty good review site. Like I've actually spent time reading their reviews about air purifiers and stuff. Like I've, I've gone through the archive to make sure it's not like looking good, but not like actually not that great. It's great. Like it's, yeah. they are gone right now, outranked by architecturaldigest.com that doesn't test any of the products. They rank number one for best air purifier. They just have stock photos. How, how, how does that work in an EAT world? Or is that really just EAT equals domain authority? It could be that it's gone in that direction lately. Listen, I don't, I don't love, I think most of us in the SEO space, most of us in general, don't love what's going on with these high authority sites being able to rank for all kinds of review stuff. It's important to remember that before the HCU, there was another new ranking system that Google introduced and that people don't really like to talk about for some the reason. It's, it's, well, no, the reviews update. It was oh, yeah. okay. product reviews, and then it got changed to reviews, which people are not talking about enough because this was in 2022 when Google decided it wasn't just product reviews, it's any type of review, which actually really means like travel, <laughs> going to places, reviewing places. Mm. And this is what I'm seeing the most clear uh, change with, with this update is people that were affected by the reviews update are now starting to see some comebacks with this update. But yeah, I think, Whatever signals Google has been using for authoritativeness, which maybe it's domain authority, that's not actually a Google metric, that's a Moz metric, but yeah. whatever people are using to, whatever Google's using to say, 
these are the sites that we trust their content. Users like these brands. Users like to come back to these sites. Are it's maybe Google has all these signals that we don't know about that shows that their users love Forbes and U.S. <laughs> News. Maybe and uh, Architectural Digest. And guess what? The question Google is, has like that Santa data. Cruz Sentinel. Do they like Santa Cruz Sentinel full of diet pill articles, etc.? <laughs> yeah, I think we're in the, first of all, we're in the middle of this update. I don't know what Google's going to do on May 5th. That's a very weird moment. That was them. my next question, actually. Yeah, I think like it's very it's very strange that they got the two month warning. I, that was I, I don't think I've ever seen Google give a warning before. And I don't I don't necessarily believe that they're going to come you know, like ripping apart all these big, mm -mm. highest Are they going to index them like they did for all these sites? No, no. But, and then a lot of these sites make the relationships very, very hard to know about. You know, some sites are very clear. This is third-party content that was contributed by a third party and we don't work with them, whatever. Other sites just integrate third parties into their content. And how is Google supposed to know? So what do you think is going to happen on May 5th? Are they just going to give up all these keywords and remove the content or are they just going to integrate it as first-party content and be compliant with the rules? Ah, uh, I mean, it would be it would be like suicide for a lot of these sites to say, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. Like this is how most of these big sites are making money now. That's why, to your point, all these sites are entering into into these into the market. And I mean, I pr I presented about this like two or three years ago. It wasn't just review sites, as we all know, that were getting into product reviews. At one point, it was like the dictionary sites were getting into product <laughs> reviews as well. So everyone needs to monetize. Everyone has less and less organic traffic and they need to find ways to make money. And this is something that seems to be working for them. Uh, I think that this is, I, I agree with the general SEO community right now that it, it's gone way too far. And uh, I think Google needs to do something about it, but I don't, I don't, uh, envy them in terms of trying to figure out how to dismantle Yeah, because then they open, up, they open up the door to spam if you can rank low authority sites, basically. So that's kind of the challenge now. And, and spam is easier than ever with AI yeah. these days. Um, but like one so... thing I will say, and people are going to rip my head off for this, I, I do spend a lot of time looking at the big sites that are doing these product reviews that tend to rank positions one through five for literally everything. It's not the worst content in the world. I understand maybe they're not doing the most rigorous product reviews, but like most of them will do some version of like, hey, we've reached out to 15 different experts on this. We have original quotes from the experts. We've talked to this doctor. We've talked to this dentist. We've talked to whatever. They make it really easy for the user to use. They do have mm -hmm. a lot of signals within the content that like, you know what? I feel like I'm reading a valuable piece of content. Now, this is not to say that the smaller sites aren't doing the same thing, but Everyone loves to hate on the big sites, but they don't love to look at why they're ranking so well in the first place and why maybe the majority of Google searchers actually really like that content. Yeah. Actually, one of my theory is that mobile experience is way better on bigger sites yeah. than it is on smaller sites. Like mm -hmm. small sites tend to be built on desktop and have low consideration for mobile experience and accessibility. Yeah. Uh, for example, so like, you know, phone sizes are still in pixels, not in RAMs, etc. Like, you know, if, let's just talk, like, if we go technical and we're like, you know, Google wants everyone to be able to use this content, even people who have uh, impairments and things like that and special browser settings so that they can actually read and call blindness and uh, all these things. And, and it's like, I'm wondering if that's one of the things. That's one of the things I work on on what the projects we work on, for example, right now. I'm like, okay, I want to be just the same level of like world class experience that these guys have in terms of web dev. Yeah. Because uh, because a lot of small sites tend to look okay on desktop, but look pretty bad on mobile, especially when you look at the ad layouts when they use Media Vine, Ad Drive, et cetera. I mean, Raptive now. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the density might be okay on desktop, but on, on mobile, it just becomes insanity quite often. Uh, and uh, but but the problem I think the, where the community is kind of enraged is like that kind of like okay content on big size for reviews is what gets the small size destroyed basically and it's it's yeah. really uh, <laughs> it's like it's like it, it, they get that they don't get penalized as much and they get two months to deal with their uh, I get it I get <laughs> it <laughs> parallel it's... SEO etc it's like um, it's 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 a bad look for Google. And it's like the the thing I was thinking about. So I'm looking at you know House Fresh I mentioned, but you know Travel Lemming for example, pretty good travel site that got uh, heavily impacted. Retro Dodo is like uh, I don't love Retro Dodo's content personally. I feel it's a little bit wordy sometimes, but like you know it's authentic, you know. Um, and it's like by creating these case studies, is Google not drying up the pool of like creators that are actually trying? And are they not going to create an environment where it's just going to be large sites half trying and, and make a mediocre search engine in the end? 
I don't know the answers to that. That seems like the direction that it's going in right now. But what everybody needs to remember is that if for whatever reason, right now you hear a lot of the SEOs uh, complaining about these results, complaining about the situation. What we're not hearing because we're not doing surveys of the general population uh, is yeah. how much people like this and how much they prefer to see this. I don't know the answers to that, but I do know Google had its highest stock price ever yesterday. Uh, you know, I do know that, I mean, it's true that Google has actually lost a tiny bit of market share, which is kind of unprecedented in the last few years. So in the last, I think, year, they lost 2% and Bing gained 2%, which is interesting. That's actually a really big deal in the SEO I space, mean, they had but... to give away GPT-4 for that. It's like, yeah. it's a big cost, honestly. <laughs> so, so yeah, does, does this environment, um, does it make it much harder for smaller players? Yeah, absolutely. The way things are going, yeah. But what we don't know is, let's say a Google I.O., they announce we're going to build a whole new tab within the organic search results that's just small bloggers or just recipe bloggers, or we're going to do this. Like, we don't know how they're going to innovate. We don't know what programs they have in store. We also don't know, for example, and this is something that we don't have access to this information, is what's happening on Google Discover. I have access to Google Discover for a lot of sites, and I will tell you a lot of the sites that are crashing and burning with SEO are getting millions of clicks sometimes daily from Google Discover. So, there might be other things happening. Maybe they'll throw a bone to these smaller publishers over time. I don't know. But uh, as the way things currently stand in SEO, I think what you're describing is true, yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, not the easiest time for a lot of people. I get the panda, the panda penguin vibes right now. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about Danny Sullivan earlier. Let's imagine tomorrow you're promoted as Google search liaison. He quits, he's tired of it. <laughs> and you are promoted. What do you tell people about creating helpful content that Google isn't telling right now to people? <laughs> that assumes that Danny is uh, like, I don't know. There, I, I can't imagine that it's an easy job and I can't imagine that he's able to just speak freely about whatever he wants, right? It's Google, they're being investigated by the DOJ. So I think it's their communications are probably very carefully controlled. Um, mm. It's not like me being there would make it a, a different situation where suddenly we could start telling the truth or something. It's like it doesn't, you know. He's saying what he what he's. He was pretty open say. before when he was a search engine then. Actually, like uh, he was pretty critical. And so yeah, on. So I think like... a lot of people don't remember that Danny was kind of an SEO once or SEO journalist once. Um, no, I mean uh, this is why I like being an impartial person because I feel like I can speak more freely and I try to just share what I'm seeing and what I think, what I believe, um, including what it seems like Google's up to, which I don't think that people at Google would be able to say a lot of the things that I say or anywhere close to it. But uh, okay, if if to answer your question, yeah, um, I think that the, what happened with the helpful content update was pretty brutal and pretty clear and doesn't look great in light of what's happening with SGE and SGE showing a lot of answers that seem like aggregated versions of what was taken away with a lot of the HCU sites. Um, but I think this is, like I said before, it's really important to adapt and to diversify your, your traffic sources. And like, you know, uh, we work with a lot of big publisher websites and generally publishers in like organic search visibility and traffic are declining. Like that's been yeah. something that's been happening across the board for a lot of big publishers. This is why they're all getting into the product review space, but there's other ways to get traffic, right? Like this is why our agency and me, like we've diverted so much of our energy and resources into Google discover. We have, so we have a, a lot of clients that are getting 60, 70, 80% of the traffic from Discover from Google compared wow. to search. Okay. So that's, you know, it's like you have to keep innovating, sitting there and digging your heels in and saying, but I'm so great. I, I deserve all yeah. this. You have to do something different. Also, YouTube, YouTube is number one right now on my biggest winners of the March core update. Um, I didn't expect we're going to be on YouTube. I didn't expect when I talked on YouTube, it was going to have as many visitors as it did. So there's other ways to get traffic that aren't all organic search. Um, and I do think it's important to try to find those opportunities as well. That's why I was trying, like, um, I was tweeting that, like, people are looking for new traffic sources, but quite often they first need to adapt their business model. Because if you're just like some guy who's making money from Mediavine or something like that, the problem is you need lots of visits to your website for that. And it's like, if you do YouTube, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, whereas if you, do, if you do sell something, you do solve both your business the business problem, like you become a real business in the eyes of Google, and then these platforms become now viable for you because 
you, you can build that relationship on the platform and you just need to go for the kill for the conversion at the end. You don't need that much traffic actually. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how a lot of small publishers probably need to pivot actually. Um, I have a funny one for you. When, uh, when Google says distribute business cards to promote your site in search, what do you think they mean? <laughs> I think they don't literally mean distribute business cards, funny enough. Um, I think it, it ties into everything that we've talked about so far, which is what do business cards do? They make, they increase impressions, branded impressions. That's think about it that way. How can you get more people to search for you? Not uh, non-branded top 10 things to do in Greece, but uh, Lily Ray's travel blog, uh, yeah. Greece travel. Yeah, I don't I don't write travel blogs. But you know what I mean? It's like, how can you get more people to like, you know what, I really liked with that person's content. So I'm going to look for that blog, because I do think that's a signal to Google. Um, so the business card comment is more about increasing brand awareness and brand visibility, I think. Okay. All right. One last question. SG is starting to roll out to normal users, even if you haven't opted in. Uh, what do you think the impact is going to be on the industry? and search in general, like how we use search as well. Yeah, um, it's it's hard to say because we're, we, we're still in this like beta. I mean, a lot of us, myself included, are in this beta version of SGE that seems like it still to this day goes off the rails. Whenever I spend, like last night I was on my couch, you might've seen I tweeted some stuff because I was like, sometimes I like to just like troll SGE because um, <laughs> it doesn't have feelings, it's not a human, so it's okay, um, but I'm like, you know, there's these certain trigger words where I'm like, you know, talking about race, talking about ethnicity, talking about uh, dictators, like talking about the these things. Yeah. And it's true that it shows fewer results than it did in the beginning. In the beginning, it was really easy for SGE to just like completely go off the rails and say terrible stuff. Now, what it's funny because what it does is it sits there and thinks for a second and then it goes, an AI answer is not available for this search. Mm -hmm. And then you can change the query and then an AI answer is available for the search. So it's like, I'm not even an expert in like hacking into AI, but like I can only imagine if and when they roll this thing out, there's going to be a lot of people who are legitimately trying to troll SG and getting a lot of horrible. And now they're going to be it. liable for what it says because now they're a publisher, basically. That's the thing. I'm like, and like you know, Google's even said, no, this you're in like the beta version, and this is going to be a different version that the public is seeing. I would love to see whatever version they're seeing. And they also said, by the way, the only place you can read about this is a very short article where he apparently spoke to Google, and they said we're doing a small limited experiment with the public, but we're only going to show SGE in situations where we're very confident about the answers. Uh, yeah, I think they have to do a very, very small test to see how people <laughs> actually like it. But, uh, I just feel like with AI, it's, it's, it always goes wrong eventually. <laughs> how do you think it's going to impact the way people use search though? Like, do you think that's going to significantly reduce the traffic again to websites? Uh, or is it more like a super feature snippet? If, if SGE rolls out with the worst case scenario that, you know, S SEOs like to think, oh, this is going to steal all our traffic, then yeah, of course it's going to cut into traffic. Same way that every other SERP feature and featured snippets and everything is cut into traffic for years. What we don't know is what the backlash will be and how much Google searchers in, gen in general will like it. Um, mm. I know SEOs are biased, but most of us that yeah. are really like have been obsessed with SGE for a while, like you go to SEO conferences, I was just at one and we're all talking about SGE and everyone's like, it's not that great. Like it's not, it hasn't really given me an exceptional answer. Maybe people don't need exceptional answers. They just need basic answers. But I think I anticipate, and we already saw this with some reactions to Barry's article where the college students people were like, how do I turn this thing off? <laughs> They're like, I'm going to get in trouble. I don't want this. So maybe if 20% of Google searchers hate it, that's enough for them to be like, we need to dial this back. It's not working. Who knows? We don't mm. know. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, what does search look like in five years? Again, these are a lot of unanswered questions. I think, um, I think I, I, I've been talking about this for years. Um, uh, people like following people. Mm -hmm. Influencer marketing is becoming a bigger and bigger thing in its various forms. So YouTube, TikTok, um, Instagram influencers, all this stuff. So I think the connection between what shows up on Google and personal branding will continue to go in a direction where it's like people like getting content from certain people and brands that they trust. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously informational content, um, a lot of like the calculators and stuff like this that have maybe had their, their glory moment in SEO over the last 10 years, it's probably not going to last much longer. Um, 
flights and hotels and travel. These are all big question marks. Google's trying to get into it, but um, I don't know. It's it's a question of whether people whether people's nature is to want websites or whether pe people are satisfied with Google answers for a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dream is actually that Google puts a follow button in the browser and a like button, so like you can actually like socialize search. You know, that'd be amazing. They own they're most getting of the there. Browser market. They're getting yeah, there. Yeah, they have the follow mean, on uh, on Discover, right? It's it's kind of crossing into search too. I mean, now it's like you could you could follow brands, you could follow uh, entities, you can follow topics. It's and you have the notes, and you have all these social features. It's becoming a lot more like a social. Does it alter really. your search results though, or like is it just like augmenting them? Uh, well, first of all, it carries into Google Discover, so you can see things yeah. that you're following. But yes, you can follow certain topics in search, and theoretically it'll say at the top of your personalized browser, your, your search experience, like, hey, you've been following this and this topic, so here's the latest news. Okay, cool. Well, I guess we don't have that in Europe. Uh, that's uh, like, I usually need to, new, go through a, I need to go through a VPN and do a bunch of stuff to actually have access to SG. So it's like, uh, it's always fun. Anyway, Lily, I know you have to go. So thanks for joining. Uh, hope you had some fun. Yeah, it was fun as always. Feisty, uh, controversial topics, but I mean, hopefully it was helpful. I mean, the point is to to be able to talk. Like Google doesn't talk upon you about these things. It's like someone someone needs to, right? People people yeah. want like real talk about this stuff. We're just trying to achieve that, uh, yeah. and that's it. Anyway, thanks for joining. Do you want people to check you out somewhere, uh, or, or follow you somewhere, whichever network you prefer? Yeah, I obviously do most of my sharing on Twitter, so it's Lily Ray X, whatever. Uh, Lily Ray NYC, and then LinkedIn as well. All back. right. Well, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this was a pretty open discussion about what's going on with Google right now, but if you got lost in translation or if you just didn't have time to watch the whole thing, here's what I took away from the discussion. One, the visibility changes that you see in tools like Ahrefs, SEMrush or Systrix in the case of Lily, don't tell the full story of what's happening on Google right now. These tools mostly track your organic rankings, but organic rankings are now one of many things displayed in the subs, with things like new feature snippet styles telling more traffic than ever, SGE, etc. It's actually quite frequent to rank the same but lose traffic during these updates and these changes are not reflected on most tools. So GSC often tells a very different story to what you see using one of these tools. So for example, authorityhacker.com looks almost flat on Ahrefs during the update because our rankings haven't moved very much. But the new sub layouts mean that our traffic actually went down quite a bit more than what you see, unfortunately for us. Second, surprise, surprise, Reddit and Quora are up again in the update, actually according to Ahrefs, so take it with a grain of salt. Reddit is up almost 25% in the last month and their organic traffic is almost seven times higher than it was one year ago. And that's despite the spam fest that's now happening where many top ranking threads and top answers are filled with affiliate links and completely gamed. We're probably at the peak of the honeymoon phase of Google and Reddit, but let's see what happens when most threads lose authenticity and users don't appreciate it anymore. Three, while Google's documentation on HEU has recently been changed to highlight the fact that it's mostly a page level system now, there is no evidence of that in the current iteration of Google with no strong recovery stories at all. HCU very much feels like the early days of Panda or Penguin where you were locked in with no way to get out for about a year. And again, it's one of these cases where Google says that you can recover in a few weeks, but there is zero observation of that in the real world. And that really fuels webmaster's defiance against the guidance that is issued by Google. And that's why I think we need podcasts like this one where people who actually walk in the trenches can tell you what's really going on. For the same content may get different results on different websites. I shared the story of a site owner that has both sites that went up and down in the same industry despite similar levels of authority, similar content pipeline, similar EEAT display, etc. And this is what makes these updates very difficult to analyze and understand. Five, while your business model is probably not a direct ranking factor, Lily has observed that many sites that have a business model other than publishing attached to them tend to maintain their ranking better than pure content sites. And a prime example of someone that I think identified that is WP Beginner. They just announced that they're offering WordPress related services as opposed to just being a blog now. And knowing the company behind it, I don't think they wanted to get into services, but after losing almost two thirds of their traffic in the recent years, despite being DR90, I think that some of that change is motivated by the idea of being reclassified by Google. And I think I'll probably write a newsletter about this, so watch out for my email. Six. Smaller sites are not the only ones losing traffic. Large sites have also been losing traffic for a while as well, which is why they tend to review keywords to make up for the lost revenue. Seven, 
Traffic diversification is now mandatory and will probably help your SEO in the long run, as Google sees real people enjoying visiting your website outside of search. So your solution to better SEO may be to focus a bit less on SEO and more on other channels like YouTube, social, email marketing, etc. So these are my main takeaways, but there are a lot more details and case studies inside the interview. So if you just skip to this part, my recommendation is to jump back and listen to the whole thing if you want all the little details and nuggets. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I did my best to talk about the real concerns of webmasters these days. And if you appreciate that work and the fact that we are trying to stay real with the industry, don't forget to like, subscribe and tell us what you think in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next episode.